Again, thank you so much for setting up this Smile Medina um, presentation online. I'm delighted to be here with you today. Mm, I would like to uh, share my good wishes for a happy title, the latest neuroscientific guidelines for enhancing what we all know is good leadership, but becoming best at it. It's also a question of looking at a few models that I would like to propose today. Uh, so from Spain, from Madrid, currently, I would like to share with you latest research insights that have to do with mindfulness, what it means and how it can assist business leaders in their daily activities, as well as a slightly older yet very current model that has to do with emotional intelligence mainly, but also with a very important notion called the SCARF, that is embracing values that will assist you in performing um, leadership attitudes to achieve organizational financial res results that are uh, seeking the highest performance possible. Right, why are we talking about it all? It's because uh, there is a very strong correlation between the stories that give people a sense of empowerment, that is having them, you know, handle, well, sentences like, I have some control, I have the sufficient agency, and that which we call the engagement. So correlated very highly with engagement. Can you see properly the screen? I'm trying to actually, let me see if I allow, if it allows me one moment, please. Yes, we can see that. All right, perfect. Great, so my very first introductory idea here is you have some lamps and a golden brain because of this rush in the last years about the neurosciences. And although this is in gold, because I think there is high value in looking at what the neurosciences overall can provide us, uh, it would be contradictory to the very idea that our brains throughout our lives are completely plastic, meaning they are perfectly wired to constantly achieve better results if we are capable of spotting where our areas of improvement are. And this, I think, is very much part of being real. Uh, be real through the reality of the leaders as well as the communities that the leader manages, guides, inspires, motivates. At the same time, this being uh, is a little bit under question. Let me tell you why. Well, poor mental health at work has reached really epidemic proportions. Employee mental health is definitely, at least in the West, one of the greatest challenges facing today's managers. And it covers a wide range of issues, including anxiety, depression, eating disorders, or post-traumatic stress that definitely bring in very many negative consequences. At the same time, there is a lot of ignorance, even denial, or sometimes mere cluelessness, which is preventing business leaders from seeing and acting upon the unvarnished truth. Therefore, I think today my presentation would urge those of you who would like to heed and pay attention to it, the very notion that we need to first recognize the crisis so that we can be good at finding the right solution. And in a way, brain enhancement cannot be a luxury for the few. I think it must be for the many. What can we do to strengthen, therefore, the brain connectivity at any age, enhancing complex problem solving, novel thinking, emotional intelligence, and mentioned earlier, agility, flexibility, and strategic leadership? These are all the questions that the fourth industrial revolution is in need for, and the skills that leaders managers, employees, people overall are required to really look into. Well, fortunately, there are some um, prospectively good examples, such as companies located in the US, one called MindMaze, which is a private initiative that has raised about 100 million last year to develop platform based on virtual reality, augmented reality, 
also computer graphics, brain imaging, and bringing in different approaches from neurobiology, cognitive psychology. There is also growing investments from the public sources, interestingly. So again, in the North American hemisphere, the National Institute of Mental Health runs the Small Business Innovation Research Program, helping the startups now commercialize research. What I found really good is the fact that the majority of the funding has been aimed at supporting IT-based as opposed to drug-based initiatives. Even Baycrest in Canada, Ontario, has secured $125 million. And this is for a new Canadian Center for Aging and Brain Health Innovation. So overall, one can say, thanks also to the World Economic Forum that has brought together 20 plus very diverse profiles from research and industry sectors, um, we can thank the forum for really seeking to enhance and improve the quality of life and function of individuals across the life course. This is what we would like to also share with you today. And starting from a very important piece of um, history, let me go back to 1995. I would like to show you a real story of a gentleman who, um, well, decided that he could rob two Pittsburgh Bank in very broad daylight. This gentleman didn't wear a mask or any sort of disguise. And he also smiled at the surveillance cameras before walking out of each bank. Obviously, later the night, police arrested the surprise Mr. MacArthur Wheeler, that's his name, and when they showed him the surveillance tapes, Wheeler stared in disbelief. He announced, I wore the juice. Right. Apparently, Mr. Wheeler thought that rubbing lemon juice on his skin would render him invisible to videotape cameras. And after all, lemon juice is true, is used as invisible ink. So, so as long as he didn't come near a heat source, he should have been completely invisible. Let me move a little bit faster now. Police concluded that Wheeler was not crazy or on drug. He was just incredibly mistaken. And the saga caught the eye of an important psychologist called David Cunning at Cornell, who enlisted his graduate student, Justin Kruger, to see what was going on. They reasoned that while almost everyone holds very favorable views of their abilities in various social and intellectual domains, some people mistakenly assess their abilities as being much higher than they actually are. And that bring, brought them, actually, or brings us today to talk about the illusion of confidence, which, by the way, is called the Dunning-Kruger effect or bias. And that's where we're going to really, uh, you know, stick to the idea reality is biased. And this bias indeed inflates self-assessment. This illusion extends even beyond the classroom. It permeates everyday life. So in a study, the two psychologists went and quizzed gun hobbyists about gun safety. So similar to the previous finding, those who answered the fewest questions correctly wildly overestimated their knowledge about firearms. And outside of factual knowledge, this Dunning-Kruger effect can also be observed in people's self-assessment of a myriad of other personalities. If you watch, for example, talent shows on television today, you will see the shock of the faces of contestants who don't make it past auditions and are rejected by the judges. It's perhaps comical to us, but these people are generally unaware of how much they have been misled by their illusory superiority. It's typical for people to overestimate their abilities, but it's also been proved that there is a similar problem with people who um, rate their relative popularity and cognitive abilities as being lower. So the problem is that when people are incompetent, not only do they reach wrong conclusions and make unfortunate choices, but they also are robbed for the ability to realize the mistakes. This is a problem. So instead of being confused, perplexed, or thoughtful about the erroneous ways, incompetent people insist that the ways are correct. And as Charles Darwin wrote in The Descent of Man, ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. 
Yet, as I was saying, really smart people also would fail accurately to self-assess their ability, which is the other side of the coin. And this is called the imposture syndrome. High achievers fail to recognize their talents. The difference here is that competent people can do and do adjust their self-assessment given appropriate feedback, or while incompetent individuals cannot, they can change. So change is another very important idea we are going to dwell on. Therein lies the key to not ending up like the witless bank robber. So sometimes we try things that lead to unfavorable outcomes, but other times, like in the lemon juice ideas, our approaches could be perfect or more rational or more adapt or just, you know, simply appropriate. So the trick is not to be fooled by illusions of superiority and to learn to accurately reevaluate your competence. After all, as Confucius said, real knowledge, knowledge I'm sorry, is knowing the extent of one's ignorance. Now, my idea is that neural leadership would reduce this uncertainty of the many biases because through technology, through scans, through experiments, through a lot of observation, maybe big data and you know artificial intelligence being so handy, we have developed a lot of notions that are allowing us to better understand what happens in the mind of those people, as well as physically looking into brains and how they perform. So Fundamentally, I think we are going to see that once we are able and capable of mitigating the biases, as well as using those biases in our favor and finding balance, those neurons that will have fire together will stick and wire together to maintain the appropriate attitudes. That is why in the next slide, I'm going to talk to you why you should hire your next corporate leader or CEO or CMO or you name it with a very eager interest in learning new things. And one study from the Harvard Business School discusses how important it is to have leaders actually being interested, for example, in having a pilot's license. Because flying a plane for the fun of it requires a very daredevil attitude and a healthy dose of curiosity, along with the requisite technical know-how and an inherent interest in the inner workings of complex machines. And this is what the psychologists who have interviewed more than 5,000 different executives found being a very successful source for people achieving innovative ideas and therefore constantly trying out new experiences and piloting those projects, those enterprises, those endeavors. Overall, they say the results suggest that while in extrinsic motivation from compensation contracts or from financial re rewards can result in higher innovation, Intrinsic motivations of pilot CEOs can be more effective in generating valuable and original innovation. So it's a sort of mindfulness taken from within that enables leaders, therefore, to acknowledge uh, where their balance is and at the same time stretching out to really embrace new operations, new perspectives, new enterprises and therefore what we call creativity at large. This definitely, if you allow me, uh, will uh, well take boards of director uh, noticing that potential CEO with a penchant of for flying can take their firms to new heights of creativity and innovation. Let's watch please this little video, which I think will already take us into what mindfulness is in a world that is most of the time troubled by a lot of air turbulences, to just use the same metaphor as earlier, but also earthly kind of complex, sometimes chaotic movements. Our fast changing VUCA world demands engaging leadership. We can no longer solve problems through rigid hierarchical organizational systems. Harnessing the latent creativity ideas and innovation within our teams and networks is how the answers and also the questions will be identified in future. This puts the spotlight directly on culture and engagement. 
Indeed, in 2015, global HR directors identified culture and engagement as one of the biggest challenges facing companies today. And leaders sit at the heart of culture and engagement. Behaviours are contagious. Facilitation, relationship and collaboration are essential skills. Emotional intelligence is no longer a nice to have. It is a must. Luckily, as much as technology has been driving advances around the globe, it has also provided the tools to understand and explore our brains in greater detail. The good news is that we now understand much more about our brain. Research in human potential and neuroscience is revealing practical ways for leaders to develop the mindset and capabilities to lead in our VUCA world. Why is this important to business and particularly leaders? Because if you add it to what we already know from the social sciences and psychology, if you consider it in relation to the leadership research and data we have available, it provides a powerful insight into how we can genuinely improve our cognitive strength, how we can develop our emotional resilience and how we can best access our latent creativity not just for our own personal benefit, but for the benefit of our wider colleagues, our teams and our businesses. It is a fascinating learning journey, one that really does shine a light on how to be a more engaging leader. If you are interested in building your capability and skill, if you want to not only understand, but also practice how to apply the latest neuroscience findings to your leadership practice, if you want to be an engaging leader, then visit our website or contact Jenny Flower to find out more about our masterclasses, our workshops and our coaching support. It's a brilliant way of leading us, I think, to the next five questions I would like to address with you, which are basically in terms of strategic decision makings, can we really say we're good at it? And if not, then what can we do? Uh, to a great extent, my answer to the first question is yes. Yet again, uh, since there is always room for improvement, let's talk as well about this fullness that we can achieve through being assertive, through being insightful inside of ourselves. And we will be assisted by what the different uh, sciences can really tell us in terms of leadership in business for performance. Uh, finally, I think the SCARF model developed by a very um, leading, I think, guru from Buzin Allen will show us how to wrap it up and take away the important tips. We are talked about biases, right? And this is a very important uh, notion that I would like to just dwell before we move on. Biases are definitely non-conscious drivers, all right? So they take place all the time. You go shopping, you watch a movie, you're talking to your best friend, neighbor, wife, uh, relative, you name it, child. And some of those cognitive quirks will just uh, get in, <laughs> in the way or will assist you actually to even um, cope and um, survive and adapt as well. So where is the middle ground? This is an important question I would like you to help me think about. That influences also how people will see the world through your eyes, but with your eyes. So I would say that overall biases are very helpful and therefore adaptive, and they enable people to make quick, efficient judgments. Sometimes, however, they could be really, really uh, mm, affecting negative, uh, negatively the surroundings. This has been seen lately in some of the newspapers. I'm not going to stop there. Um, but I think in a hyper-connected world where poor decisions can multiply as if in a chain reaction, breaking free of unhelpful bias has never been more important. And I think it's very relevant to uh, see some 
uh, figures again, U.S. companies spend an estimated 300 million to try and look at diversity programs, sensitivity training, so that executives and managers and other employees are being told to watch for out for biases and promoting wiser decision making. Something that I would like to really. Uh, look at with you. Now, very quickly, I'm going to give you 15 seconds. Uh, take a look at this picture and jot down, please, what you see in it. Starting now. Exactly. You probably wrote down that maybe you see a couple sitting on a bench or you can see their blanket surrounded by trees. Maybe it's a garden and so on. Remember, please, that evolutionarily speaking, eyesight is really the oldest and even best developed sense of all of the others. Now, if I show you the front picture, we will be surprised probably or, uh, you know, at least a little bit. Um, uh, moved by the idea that instead of another human being here, you have a dog. This is what reality is about. We are good at it, except for the fact, not always, not really, right? Sometimes there are some mismatches and some gaps. And this takes us straight into these slides, whereby we have a gentleman walking and having in his mind a series of ideas, concepts, constructs, very, very cluttered. On the right hand side, the little animal accompanying him or her is actually more tuned with the most important stuff, if you allow me to say so, in the sense that he's walking, so he doesn't want to get into you know, the tree or get stopped by uh, too much sun. And, and this idea is being mindful, living in the present. So it's a very simple kind of maintaining a moment by moment awareness but not just of what surrounds you, right? Because that would be a little bit too alienating. It's actually the idea of moving your internal eye towards your thoughts, your feelings, your bodily sensation, and then connecting to the rest of the world. This is what mindfulness together with neural leadership, I beg your pardon, is really all about. And it takes us into the very first answers to the question, are we good at making decisions? So yes, let's look at the low road and the high road, which would be the right direction to take. Minding brains to being good at performing in times of tough ones. As a leader, how do you figure out the right thing to do? And how do you develop the habit of making better decisions? Neuroscientists and psychologists are beginning to learn what happens inside the human mind and brain at moments of choice. During stressful times, leaders need to pay attention to their emotional states because their emotional states will impact directly the capacity they have to focus their attention and make wise decisions. When making a business decision, you're likely to focus your attention in one of two ways. If you're making a deal or thinking about satisfying your needs or those of others, you're probably on the low road. This pattern of mental activity involves desire, expedience, immediate value, rapid problem solving, and the need for relief. It's a familiar path and has real relevance, especially in business. What are your consumers willing to pay? What does your boss want right this second and in the next quarter? These questions will trigger the low road. The other path is the high road. When you reflect on your deepest long-term goals and how to achieve them, or when you inquire and reflect on what people are thinking and what they're likely to do, this will trigger the high road. When you take the high road, you're listening to your inner voice a wise advocate who is oriented not just to your desires, needs, and success, but to the overall long-term value of the entire system. This inner voice may not be obvious to everyone, but it's always there. When you act with it in mind, you gain the dispassionate perspective of a clear-minded observer. 
under circumstances of stress, the first thing that leaders need to do is press pause and become mindful and just settle down some of those automatic low road reactions that will have us make compulsive decisions, not necessarily wise ones. By focusing your attention on the high road of the mind, you will continually strengthen the associated brain circuits. Over time, this gives you a greater facility for wise leadership, the kind of leadership that allows people to navigate large organizations towards seemingly impossible goals. So despite the idea of rushing all the time towards the 5,000 decisions we need to make uh, on average every day, and this notion to solve most dilemmas by maybe clicking the pause button, I think we have a very important uh, way out, right, from the dilemma, mainly because I would like to take away three lessons. First of all, the idea that the brain is plastic, and if you train it to go very fast, very, very far away from you, but then also moving back very gently and very nicely, kindly minding the kind of step-by-step -step process the brain needs to really find the solution, then you're managing properly, not just against emotions, which, you know, when we talk about change, are aroused because you feel fear, you feel anxiety, you may feel distressed, you feel resourceless and so on. You move with them and you listen to what comes in, but also let them out to make space for the better ones. And this is what the brain gain advantage is about. So change indeed is hell for people who are afraid of it. It can be convoluted, mysterious, very rebellious because it's the unknown altogether. Uh, we will not use it, however, as a notion for uncertainty as hunting or doubting. Rather, as I think I pointed out earlier, we will use it like Pollock, as a source for inspiring yourself, for moving into the unknown with the confidence that something good, something like a gold nugget will come out of it. Uh, the second question was, uh, basically, does neuroscience applied to business help us in performance? And here we have an experiment run in one of the TED Talks by Dana Rielli, one of my favorite gurus, which shows tables, tops, uh, left hand side. I'm not going to ask you. Probably most of us would still see it longer than the right hand side one, which is just fine. Yet again, um, and I promise we haven't really tinkered with the picture or the images, taking the tabletop on the right and overlaying it, you will see it's exactly the same. Although on the picture on the right corner, if I move it back, I'm probably sure most of you would keep seeing, like I do, uh, shorter. So. I don't know if it's a question of whether we want to sit at the longer or shorter tables in life, but I think it's very much a question of trusting what I would believe Dana really to say or to show me. And once this trust is in, it doesn't matter if I'm still seeing the two tabletops different, as long as I know in my background, in my you know back office mind, in my remote uh, unconscious brain that the two tabletops are actually the same. Another uh, lovely painter who for me was a great source of inspiration in terms of understanding why reality can be so remote is Mr. Magritte who showed us um, in a painting called This is Not a Pipe something that resembles it yet for him is not the real object. This takes me also back to the idea of how mentally ill are we at the workplace. And in an interesting, very famous research project, again, people who were supposedly extremely accurate on how they saw the world all the time were then categorized as clinically depressed. And this is described in a, um, well, brilliant and very enjoyable kind of book called The Seven Laws of Magical Thinking, How Irrational Beliefs Keeps Us, keeps us Happy, Healthy, and Sane. And the researchers found, for example, that depressed subjects estimated the control over the light much better than the non-depressed subjects did. So they called this phenomenon the depressive realism. 
therefore, I think that in terms of business, what we're looking for is people who would begin their day or their life or their professional careers and keeping that balance tuned in uh, all the time so that their beliefs are founded on the notion that the future is better than the present, although I'm living in this present and building and constructing what comes next, as well as I have the power to make it so from my past, from my experiences, because the change that is required is not threatening, hunting or daunting, but rather is a very resourceful uh, fountain of youth and of intelligence. This allows you to actually start flying, like you can see in this yogic posture. And that leads nicely, I would say, to talking about the different worldviews we can have. And I'm not going to mention so much the traditionality because it is always evolving, fortunately. But I think SCARF, which stands for status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness, um, notions we're going to look at just in a moment, are basically leaders, SCARF leaders, are those who are capable of cultivating the awareness of the moment while recognizing those threshold threat responses that need to, you know, engage emotions to a point where you detach yourselves from them and engage, on the other hand, your more uh, computational cognitive abilities to get out of the mess or the difficult, apparently complex um, environment, while they slow things down for everybody to be on board and making sure communication uh, get through. This is again an HBR article from uh, this year. In sum, a new era very much demands a different approach. So uh, today leaders are focused on identifying and developing talent while laboring to create healthy environments that allow individuals to apply their talents and skills in pursuit of the key objectives. The Internal chat sometimes can be very deafening. Yet again, it's a question of tuning in and I think going beyond bias. How so? Well, um, let's talk a little bit about an experiment made by Tversky and Kahneman, who earned then eventually a Nobel Prize, uh, despite being psychologists, uh, but uh, understanding way better sometimes economic phenomena. Um, they said that when an opportunity is framed as a gain, right, people tend to be relatively conscious of the risk involved because, you know, they really want to go for that gold rush. But if the risk is framed as a way to avoid a loss, then people are more likely to ignore or simply justify it. So safety biases like that can influence the decision about the probability of the risk or return or the allocation even of resources. And these biases will affect your financial decisions. For example, you are not being able to let go of a business unit because of a resource already invested in the project or not being willing to innovate in a new direction because it would compete with the company's existing business. To mitigate them, you can conduct conversations. So it's a little bit what I have here in the text of the slide. And detach yourself so that you have a better perspective, like a front and a back kind of understanding, as well as involving other people to join you. And this is why the SCARF really starts talking about status. Status because since its introduction in 2008, the SCARF model has been really um, demonstrated as one of the best ideas in 15 years by the Strategy and Business magazine. And as I said, status because it increases awareness of the intricate network in which you operate. But it also allows you through the certainty, through the autonomy and the relatedness to influence others. And overall, that meritocracy you're implementing in your organization will improve the general interactions. So back to communication as status. Um, I think we are human beings and as such it's very very important for us um, to re 
review to, to consider uh, by comparing and contrasting our position and by positioning ourselves, obviously demonstrating our best skills. So this is a little bit where status all starts. That again, certainty has to do with what you have others do with you and for you, right? Um, and how they perceive such experiences and store them in their memories because then steering their behaviors is going to be way easier. In an experiment, again, by Kahneman and this time Fredrickson, they had two groups um, putting their hands in two types of buckets. The first group had a blue bucket at minus nine Celsius degrees, uh, kept, uh, you know, uh, for 60 seconds, their hands in that very cold water. The other group had their hands in the same kind of water, but they also were requested for an extra 30 seconds at minus eight, namely just one Celsius degree, uh, let's say higher temperature, better temperature. Then they were asked, uh, you know, would you like to repeat the same experiment next week? And guess what? the very first blue, blue bucket group said, no thanks, it was just very painful, we would rather not repeat. But the second group will have that extra little reward of less pain for oh, an extended amount of time, was actually very willing to come back and try again. This takes us also to the idea of autonomy. Let people choose what is their comfort zone sufficient enough for them to be able to carry out the very tough kind of, um, you know, activities or, um, uh, yeah, uh, following their objectives in their best way, even if it's sometimes uh, saying no to you and carrying a different kind of burden. Now, there is always light at the end of the tunnel insofar as relatedness, because research proves over and over again that although we may make decisions internally very much on our own, we are so much connected uh, to prevent us from falling into our own biases to which we may be ignorant and blind to, that it's very, very relevant. So to avoid the very self-interest or distorting attachments and memory, as well as emotional tags, let's have fresh blood into the organization uh, telling us what we could do better. Uh, it may have happened to you that maybe you are on a hiring spree and you're interviewing people thinking that it would be good to have some diversity whether it's by gender, whether it's by ethnicity, uh, because of the languages they may speak, the kind of markets they may know. And you have uh, obviously a good set of candidates, except for the fact that when it boils down to really looking at the one you need, you are going to be mm, deciding for the person who most resembles the team because at the last moment you think, oh my gosh, I think it's better to have harmony rather than conflict in your organization. Happens to me all the time. Um, so in a way, we need to practice that kind of shortcuts to prevent ourselves from falling back over and over again. And this is where fairness with ourselves has to start. I think it's very much a question of how we want to also see um, us, you know, again, this balance of the lemon man versus perhaps the very arrogant kind of leader versus perhaps the person who underestimates herself all the time and misses on the flying opportunities. So the scarf ends up with uh, this practicing notion because the more you do, the more you connect, the more open you are, the more likable you are, you have that safety, you have that certainty being implemented and your status is actually reinforced in a very surprising and exponential way. But uh, to mitigate somewhat maybe my words, I have chosen this video, uh, which was produced during Halloween last week, uh, last year, I beg your pardon. Uh, it's, it's not always uh, fun during the year, but uh, there are times when it is. Yes, indeed. And uh, Taylor Swift here is going to show us that she hates actually training the cardio bit, but there is a but in it. Man, I hate cardio. 
activity playlist, running, hashtag gym flow, Drake and future. All right. out on whether it's the treadmill or it's uh, Taylor Swift winning. <laughs> Thank you for watching. The logic here is about reward versus threats. And I'm just going to mention again the very important highlights for mindfulness. It's greater cognitive resources. It's more insights. It's uh, more ideas for acting rather than fearing that you're being threatened. It's fewer perceptual errors and wider fields of view. This is why the science of optimal human performance really talks about the TRUM, the tangible, the repeatable, observable, and measurable procedures that will bring more light, more critical thinking that is positive for the focus, the flexibility, the emotional regulation, avoiding that very uh, negative ambiguity, but not reducing necessarily the uncertainty as a source of, you know, um, inspiration. The biases are reduced if we work together and therefore we are good also at reading other people's behaviors. So some of the tips are there. And this is to summarize as well the fact that we want to move away uh, like a magical hat. It takes us away from, you know, the low end into the high road of this extraordinary kind of human performance we can achieve. In important books uh, by Matthew Hudson, uh, this is uh, basically the fundamental notion of how to make life magical in a scientific way. He points out that uh, we often see meaning where there isn't any, like in this picture, maybe where there is, you know, a diver coming out from the depth of a human body. Um, and we prefer maybe to talk about less accurate stories rather than concrete facts. We give symbolic importance to easily replaceable items. Um, would you swap your wedding ring for a different one? Would you, you know, change your watch for somebody else's and so on? And believe that the things were meant to be. This is very important. It's so important that it goes beyond the irrational. Um, this explicit belief is in the summoning power of names, for example, exists not only within sorcery circles, but also within the walls of psychiatric hospitals. No surprise. If you are in a psychiatric ward, there is a good chance you'll have a number of irrational beliefs, of course. Then in, in an article published in the Psychiatric Quarterly, the clinical director uh, of an English uh, hospital actually noticed that this name belief was not just amongst the inpatients, but also amongst the wards or the employees. He says that he remembers sitting around with staff chatting, and they had a number of magical ideas that they developed over time. And uh, one, for example, was not to mention the names of discharged patients, because otherwise they would come back. So believing, we know that, that you are lucky will increase your performance just like that. Believing in fate will help you cope because when things are bad or didn't go the way you expected, then saying it was meant to be makes a lot of sense. Placebos, hey, hey, there they go. And they have the same kind of powers, almost superpowers as other things. And making routines as rituals you probably know better than I do, you know, is a fabulous way of keeping your brain in tune with yourself so that the whatever comes uh, allows even for deluded love to be the best love, seeing the one you love as better than they really are, which improves the long-term connectedness. 
So to end on the happiness hypothesis, Jonathan Haid, another brilliant writer, author, researcher, evidence shows that people who hold pervasive positive illusions about themselves, their abilities and future prospects are mentally healthier, happier, live longer, and are better liked even uh, by those who lack such illusions. So long live happiness, purpose, control and optimism not over optimism because we're not the lemon man uh, but indeed a pinch of magical uh, values and virtues finally why strategies need to be behavioral because you need to grab a smile for performance <laughs> this has been proved to me when I watched this Jerry's game it's uh, an edited by me short movie produced uh, back then by Pixar uh, then Pixar was sold in 2006 to Disney for the juicy sum of $7.4 billion. It also catapulted uh, Steve Jobs then as being the largest individual shareholders with 7% uh, in, on the board. I'm leaving you with this uh, little blink of the eye. <laughs> I would like now to give my thanks. Thank you very much for your time. A very thoughtful gift for me. Thank you. Grazie mille in my Italian language. Shukran to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. By the way, um, just to let you know that um, the former Alphabet executive is working on an idea to detect mental health disorders by how you type on your phone. So can a smartphone detect whether users suicidal or depressed is <laughs> the next piece of research. Thank you again. <coughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Now, let me go. Uh, folks, we are now open for question and answer. So if you have any questions, you could either insert or put it in the question box, or you could equally raise your hand. There's a hand icon available on the console, so please click on it if you want to speak directly to the Professor. But let me go to the question box. There are a couple of them already posted. When an opportunity is framed as a gain, people tend to be relatively conscious of the risk involved. But if the risk is framed as a way to avoid a loss, then people are more likely to ignore or justify it. This is true even though the objective information is the same in both cases. When aware of this phenomena, should we manipulate the information? It's a bit, uh, Thank, you. Thank you so much, yeah. Um, yeah. Can you hear me by the way? Yes, we can hear you and we can see you now. Thank you very much for displaying the webcam. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I'm actually displaying my back office here with some of the machines I have, as you can see. Um, manipulation is a very interesting word to me because it really comes from the idea of hand, right? In your hand. So it goes back to my idea. How can we physically improve our environment? Um, some research again shows that if you have electric lighting and turning on the bulb uh, next to you may assist you while you are in search for some important concepts that may be escaping you. You're writing a letter, you're writing your notes, uh, you want that light right, to come through you. Uh, you may have a box stepping in and out. 
there is amazing architecture that is being developed. So yes, I think manipulation is the best thing you can do when you are in such uh, dire, um, dire dilemmatic, um, you know, uh, proposals. Um, it, uh, it, it's a piece of research that Kahneman wrote some maybe 20 years ago. So things have evolved and things have uh, definitely improved. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have uh, another one. Uh, okay, normally it is said that on average a person gets about 60,000 thoughts in his or her mind, out of which 85% of our daily thoughts are composed of negativity. How can we transform ourselves into a positive person by continuously fighting against these negative thoughts? Is this your question, Mr. Ali? Yes, and there's a question. Oh. Yours, right? No, this is from the audience, yeah. Oh, from the audience in general. Okay, right. Oh, okay, in general. <laughs> Can you just repeat how what is the percentage, please? Is that 60? I did I understand correctly? Yeah, on average 60,000 thoughts a day a person gets and 85% are considered negative. So how do you convert right. yourself into a positive? Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I think the polarity is definitely very important. I think it's a question of energy. Um, if you're dragged down by just 15% and it's too heavy a burden, I think you should stick to the negativity. I think it's great to have 85% negative because that negative is what keeps you going. Um, it's like stress, right? You have a threshold. You can take as much as you want, which is wonderful. Um, it, it's, it's a very personal question. Now, I think that... It's brilliant to talk about the entire audience talking about 85% because that wouldn't be an average anymore, right? <laughs> um, so I don't know if there are any, you know, um, exceptions to that or if there are any miscellaneous points outside that regression analysis that we're making. And maybe we're assuming 85% is a little bit too many, um, which is fine by me. And if you ask me how to convert them into a positive, well, again, I think we all have our tricks um, up the leaves. It's like playing, playing chess or playing poker, but why not just go and watch, you know, uh, a race, uh, whether it's motorbikes or it's cars, and that will probably bring some adrenaline and help you breathe deeply and enjoy what comes next, which looks definitely being safer. Or you could uh, simply go and, you know, have a rest, whether with a coffee. Uh, caffeine is very good for that. I think everything that is symbiotic, everything that is close to what is negative to you would reinforce that negativity to the point where it becomes unsustainable or so sustainable that you're still in it, which is fine. Because I believe positive and negative are very much subjective. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me move to another question. Is this if, if I'm not, I'm sorry, uh, sure. sorry about that, sure. just interrupting you. If I'm not answering or if, please, there are comments to my uh, appropriate, inappropriate answer, please let me know because I think a dialogue would be better than just keeping on having me say things that uh, maybe are not hitting the wall at all. Yeah, I agree. Now, folks, if you want to even... Um, if you want to talk directly to the professor, you can always raise your hand and I can unmute your microphone. So let me uh, go to another question box. Is the SCARF model in opposition to the idea of a more hierarch hi hierarchical approach to leadership? Um, well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think it does. It does conflict to a great extent. Yes, because um, I haven't talked really about traditional. Um, and I would like to unravel some of my thoughts on that. I wrote a PhD thesis called Going Out of Business, all right? Um, and I wrote it on the success story of the Harvard Business School. So that criticality that I hinted at, not just 
20 years ago, but today have to do a lot with how grateful I am to the tradition that precedes me. And I don't think you can improve um, as much as you can criticize. Um, if you criticize and you take that criticism to being consequentially good for the majority, uh, then you're on the right track, in my view. Which means, unless you have a very great tradition, unless you have very strong uh, senior foundations for your edifice, uh, you can't just grow smaller, taller, different, brighter, brighter, whatever. So that's why I, I don't want to detach scarf from traditional. But it does go against, specifically, the hierarchy. Um, and it doesn't go against the hierarchy necessarily as top to bottom, right? Which is fine, uh, because status has to do with top and has to do with middle and has to do with horizontal and has to do with maybe isolated or subsidiaries. But it has to do with, I don't want to be just liked for what I am. I want to be liked because you are convinced I am good at you or to you or for you. So I haven't mentioned Bez, Jeff Bezos, I'm sorry, from Amazon, who still says, I'm running my company like day one. And I have 150,000 plus employees, I believe. And, you know, or I don't know how many subsidiaries around the world um, or units. Uh, why does he do it? Well, he does it because he has this great trust, like the tabletops, right? Uh, he believes that his institution can be run like the first day. He believes that even if it doesn't agree with a decision, it's better that the decision be speedy to take action because somebody has said it is needed to. So that, in a way, he commits and gives the resources or signs in, but keeps an eye and checks back and forth whether that decision really is, you know, uh, heading and hitting the targets. I think that's a very, if one wants, good compromise. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, another one, um, in your view, who are some of the most influential leaders with brains that are currently or have previously managed the corporate world towards better change? Can you name a few and perhaps give some of their inspirational examples? Hmm. Okay, that uh, dovetails with, uh, I think, some examples. Well, you don't know my father. Uh, <laughs> I don't know very well the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I've been only once. Fortunately, I've been invited uh, back in November. Uh, very happy to have been there. It's one of my latest top experiences. Um, I read um, the Arabian business magazine regularly. Um, there are so many leaders in their own styles. Um, my little children, my three-year-old are leaders, little leaders, and you wouldn't know them either, and they haven't done much yet, but I think they're very assertive. They link to uh, the family, they relate, they um, understand that there are seniority uh, figures uh, they respect and even adjust to. Um, providing kindness, I think, is what keeps them really tuned in with their grandparents. Uh, I have leaders uh, in mind that are definitely inspirational, and maybe because I'm lucky. <laughs> I've worked with mostly people who have given me so much more that I'm still, you know, in due and I'm still owing them, and I'm still very, very uh, happy about uh, being able to continue and maintain a solid uh, dialogue. Uh, I would love to hear more from what the persons who have discussed this question could share with me. I would like to hear what they think, if you don't mind. Could you do that for me, Mr. Ali? Or could they perhaps share with us today what they have in mind? 
Uh, yes, it's a good idea. And folks, I mean, uh, it's an open. If you can also share some of the names which you consider as influential leaders. Uh, but in the meantime, let me move to another question. We have, uh, how is mindfulness harnessed to avoid bringing negative consequences? Another one on negativity. Uh, how it should be used? Would that be the same kind of question, or, sh or does mindfulness have negative consequences as well, which how, I believe it has? Is, yeah, how is mindfulness harnessed to avoid bringing negative consequences? Oh. Yes, bringing negative consequences. Well, <laughs> okay, that's, that's a tough one. Be, 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 Okay, I think it's blinking. Yes. Right. I um, well, I think most seminars fail mm -hmm. if um, you don't have a critical mass, right? I think seminars will not be helping people uh, if there isn't sufficient critical mass around them to assist them in making them feel that everybody is kind. And yet again, even one person can be so kind to that unwilling person that this person will either decide to stay and then start perhaps understanding that kindness is the only way forward, or that person will leave but will still remember that, you know, uh, whatever she experienced during that kindness is going to be the only uh, only way for her to experience change, change in the most fruitful manner. Um, in a way, I think SCARF, because it gives the status, the autonomy, but it also provides relatedness, listening, communicating, you know, having a space for making your beliefs more certain and exposing your fears in a safe environment. Um, it's like confessing to yourself that uh, you know you are very much worth it you're very much um enjoying what you're doing you're very much showing yourself that there is a possibility to perform to perform better the scarf is is a great highlight is a great highway for that because it already gives you all the steps step by step and it provides a lot of uh, examples on how leaders um, 
well, definitely behave for performance to be achieved, where it not just Steve Jobs. Uh, and it doesn't matter to me so much whether, uh, you know, fashion comes and goes insofar as you cannot just throw things away to the bin without acknowledging, first of all, that they have been there for uh, a meaningful, a meaningful actuation, a meaningful act in life or in the existence of people. So even if you don't like scarf, I think you can still uh, take away some value from it by saying, well, it doesn't fit my organization. It doesn't help me in that area, but it has helped others to actually improve very, very much because it's like a big protection. It's like an insurance. It's like a, a blue ocean. It's like a way of, you know, uh, financially as well as uh, emotionally and humanly to look at the problems uh, in front of you, ahead of you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Contardo. That really brings us towards the end of the webinar. So any quick concluding remarks that you would like to give before we dismiss out? Um, well, I trust that, you know, um, the examples will stick with you in your mind, will provide better understanding of uh, the many intricacies and adocracies. I have been delighted, of course, to be in collaborating with Mao. Long live Mao, and uh, thank you again. Thank you very much once again. Uh... Uh, for your time for delivering this live presentation through Miles platform. So I really want to thank you on behalf of the Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship, Miles, and uh, looking forward to remaining engaged with you. So thank you very much, Professor, and thank you all of those who participated in this webinar. We are recording it. Please stay tuned to webinar.mile.org to learn about our upcoming programs, webinars, or equally to access the recorded versions. With that note, I would like to end and conclude. So you all have a good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're calling from. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Best wishes.